Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Melvin Ignato? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background in this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Melvin Ignato was born on March 26, 1938, and grew up in Kentucky. He worked for an import-export company based in Asia and earned pretty good money. At some point, Melvin married, had three children, and divorced. After his divorce, he purchased a 32-foot speedboat and a Corvette. In 1986, he entered into a romantic relationship with a nursing assistant named Brenda Sue Schaefer after they went on a blind date. Brenda was described as naive and as having an affinity for older, wealthy men. She only made $7.50 an hour in her job. She was impressed by Melvin's much higher income. On Valentine's Day, 1987, Melvin gave Brenda a 2.3 carat diamond engagement ring. She accepted his offer of marriage. Eventually, the relationship went bad Brenda indicated that Melvin mistreated her, he was repulsive, and she was planning on leaving him. In addition, Brenda was sneaking around with an ex-boyfriend. She was cheating on Melvin. In 1988, Melvin decided to murder Brenda out of revenge for her desire to reject him. At this time, Brenda was 36 years old and Melvin was 50. Melvin enlisted the help of a former girlfriend named Mary Ann Shore Inlow. They planned to kill Brenda in Mary's house. Melvin and Mary prepared for weeks to commit the murder. They dug a grave in the backyard, and they tested the house to make sure that screams could not be heard outside. On September 23, 1988, Brenda traveled to see Melvin in order to give him some of his jewelry back. He took her to Mary's house, telling her that they would engage in a sex therapy class. When Brenda tried to leave Mary's house, Melvin pulled a gun on her, and tied her up. He then sexually assaulted and tortured Brenda for several hours before killing her with chloroform. Mary took pictures of the crime as it was happening and directly participated in the crime. Melvin and Mary buried Brenda in the backyard after taking her jewelry. Melvin placed the rolls of film from the camera and the jewelry in a plastic bag. He then hid the bag in a floor vent in his house using tape, so he taped it up inside the vent so it would not be easy to detect. After Brenda was reported missing the next day, the police started investigating. Brenda's 1986 Buick Regal was found in the morning on the shoulder of Interstate 64 in Louisville, Kentucky. It had a flat tire and a broken window. The police spoke to Melvin. He admitted that he was with Brenda, but said that she was alive and well when she left his home at 11 p.m. on September 23. The police suspected that Melvin was involved, but their investigation had a few problems. They did not know where Brenda's body was, Melvin did not make any inculpatory statements, and they could not find any physical evidence connecting Melvin to Brenda's disappearance. The police manipulated Melvin by telling him he could clear his name by testifying before a grand jury. During the testimony, he talked about how a woman named Mary Ann Shore could give him an alibi. The police had never heard her name before. This was new information. This led to Mary being called to testify. She testified that she had seen Brenda Schaefer on one occasion. The prosecutor asked her what Brenda looked like. Mary responded, you mean the last time I saw her, implying that she had seen her on more than one occasion. The prosecutor jumped on this inconsistency, and Mary literally fled from the witness stand. She stood up and ran out of the courthouse. The police interviewed Mary. She confessed to planning the murder and taking pictures. She said that she was not in the room when Melvin murdered Brenda. On January 10, 1989, Mary showed investigators where Brenda's body was buried. The police thought that maybe there was evidence on Brenda Schaefer's body that would connect her death to Melvin, 
but by that time any DNA or fluids had degraded and could not be identified. Even though they pretty much had Mary on first-degree murder and a number of other charges, the police really wanted to charge Melvin. They weren't that interested in Mary. They thought that Melvin was a more serious and dangerous offender. They offered Mary an incredible deal, cooperate with them and testify against Melvin in exchange for a tampering with evidence charge. She took the deal. By this time, the FBI was involved. Mary wore a wire and met with Melvin, hoping to elicit inculpatory statements. Investigators told her to say that she thought the property behind her house was going to be purchased by a developer. Therefore, they would be digging up the ground and would find Brenda's body. So she was upset. She was looking to Melvin to introduce solutions to this problem. Of course, during this process, the theory was that he would make inculpatory statements. Melvin was captured in the audio recordings, admonishing Mary for letting the FBI rattle her. He implied it didn't matter who started digging on the property because they had made a deep hole. He also told Mary that the FBI didn't have any information that could be used against them. The prosecutors listened to the recordings, and they were confident they could convict Melvin of murder. He was arrested and charged with murder on January 11, 1990. Melvin had to sell his house in order to pay for his defense. So it appears as though he really couldn't get back into it to remove the inculpatory evidence that he had hid in the vent. So he was kind of stuck. He was in prison, and someone else was going to own his house. Melvin's trial started in December of 1991. The state's case ran into a problem in a few areas. The first problem was that the jury didn't quite know what to make of the recording. There was one particular segment where they struggled. Melvin said to Brenda, quote, It's not shallow that place we dug, and it's not shallow, so don't let it get you rattled. Besides that one area by where that site, it does not have any trees by it, unquote. It's not clear why he said it's not shallow twice, but that was what was on the recording. The jury could not decide if Melvin used the word sight or safe, as if he was talking about burying a safe, and this had nothing to do with a murder. The second problem with the state's case was the behavior of Mary Ann Shore. She did not make a good impression on the jury. Mary wore a very small miniskirt when she testified, she laughed while testifying. She had been offered a deal that was so enticing it might lead to deception. And the jury felt as though Mary was just trying to get revenge on Melvin. The defense argued that Mary killed Brenda alone. After all, Brenda's body was found behind Mary's house, not behind Melvin's house. Melvin was found not guilty on all charges. The federal government started pursuing a case against Melvin for perjury. On October 1, 1992, about a week before that trial was to start, the new owners of Melvin's house made a discovery while pulling up the carpet. A plastic bag was found in a floor vent. It contained the jewelry and the three rolls of film. The police were contacted. The jewelry that was found in the bag was the jewelry that Brenda was returning to Melvin the night she disappeared. The 105 photographs which were developed featured crimes being committed against Brenda, just as Mary had described. A man was also in the photographs. His face was not visible, but the police were able to match patterns of moles and hair on his body to Melvin Ignato. Because Melvin had been acquitted, double jeopardy prevented him from being tried again on the same charge. Melvin was prosecuted on federal charges for perjury, which he committed during his grand jury testimony. He said that he did not kill Brenda, but clearly he did. Melvin admitted in court that he murdered Brenda. He told her family that she died peacefully. Melvin was convicted for perjury and sentenced to eight years in prison. He was out in five. After he was released, the state prosecuted him for additional perjury charges. Brenda's employer had threatened to kill Melvin if he didn't indicate where Brenda was. This resulted in a trial in 1989, during which the employer was convicted of harassment. Melvin testified in that trial, 
saying he did not kill Brenda. Melvin was convicted of perjury and sentenced to nine years. He served about four and a half. He was released in December of 2006. Melvin moved to Louisville, Kentucky, and lived in an apartment. One of Melvin's neighbors implied that Melvin wasn't doing too well mentally or physically. The neighbor would hear Melvin screaming for Jesus to come get him because he was in a lot of pain. The neighbors were probably confused why Melvin was yelling for Jesus when his behavior was more consistent with asking Satan for help. But either way, I think the neighbors felt sorry for Melvin. They recognized he was in a lot of pain. On September 1, 2008, 70-year-old Melvin Ignato was found dead in his apartment. It appears as though he fell into a coffee table with a glass top and was severely cut when the glass broke. There was a trail of blood on the way to the kitchen and then on the way to his bedroom. Like Melvin injured himself, tried to get to the kitchen, but then changed his mind and started moving toward his bedroom. He bled to death as a result of his injuries. Mary Ann Shore Inlow was convicted of tampering with evidence and sentenced to five years in prison. She was released in 1995 after serving just over three years. She died on August 26, 2004, at the age of 54. Now moving to my analysis. Let's take a look at Melvin Ignato's personality. Based on many descriptions that were reported, Melvin was arrogant, condescending, grandiose, vindictive, and lied all the time. He frequently tried to impress people. He would tell people these incredibly difficult-to-believe stories that were obviously not true. Between the time of the murder and when he was arrested, Melvin was not cautious with the statements he made. Even though he didn't confess, he was happy to talk to reporters any time they showed up. He even fell for the grand jury testimony trick. It made absolutely no sense that he would testify before a grand jury. What's so unusual about Melvin is that he waited so long to commit a crime like this. Typically, the depraved desires that lead to this type of crime form very early in life. But here we see that Melvin started when he was 50. For some reason, he was particularly offended that Brenda rejected him, even though he had been rejected on other occasions by other women. I think what happened here is that he was certain Brenda was going to marry him. When she rejected him, it dealt a blow to his pride that was too great. His grandiosity, arrogance, and sense of entitlement were not strong enough to protect him from the rejection. It penetrated his shield of narcissism and unleashed his vindictiveness. Revenge was the only behavior that could restore stability to his mood, to allow him to once again believe in his self-delusion of greatness. He was so offended by Brenda's behavior that simply killing her was not enough. He wanted her to suffer tremendously. He wanted a third party to witness the humiliation, believing that would make the suffering more intense and allow someone else to see him restore his reputation, to witness his vindication. So really, he wanted somebody to celebrate with. That's why Mary was there. Moving to Mary Ann Shore Inlow, she participated actively during the crime. She was not anything like an innocent bystander or even a less culpable conspirator. I can appreciate why she was offered a plea deal, but she already confessed when that deal was made. It should have been something like murder two and 25 years in prison, not tampering with evidence and five years in prison. She managed to escape justice in this case. Mary seemed to have pronounced boundary problems and a lack of insight. Her laughter when describing terrible behavior was disturbing, and she did not seem to appreciate how her choice of apparel might be inappropriate for a courtroom setting. Moving to the next part of the analysis, some of the greatest injustices that we see in the criminal justice system involve an innocent person being convicted. In this case, we see the opposite, a guilty person being found not guilty. After the acquittal, the judge wrote an apology letter to the victim's family and implied that justice may come later. Clearly, the judge believed the jury made a mistake, as did many people. The jury was bound to the standard of reasonable doubt. I think the blame in this case falls on the state, not on the jury, because there was 
reasonable doubt in this case. Here are just a few examples. Item number one, on two occasions, the police searched the house that Melvin shared with his mother, but they didn't find the evidence that he hid in the floor vent. They strongly suspected that he kept the jewelry and the film based on Mary's statements. He had to put those items somewhere. They should have searched more thoroughly. Item number two, the investigators wasted time chasing leads generated by psychics. It's really worrisome that they keep falling for these same tricks. Their desperation to find evidence pushes them towards these psychics that only waste time. Item number three, prosecutors failed to properly prepare Mary as a witness. They should have known how the jury would perceive her and coached her better to present in a way more consistent with courtroom testimony. Item number four is how investigators squandered the opportunity to use Mary as an informant. They had her wear a wire yet they failed to induce strongly inculpatory statements. Instead of sending her in with a story about the land where Brenda's body was buried, being purchased, and developed, they should have focused on Melvin's excitement and desire. They were hoping to motivate Melvin based on his fear, but he was fearless. He took great pride in showcasing how fearless he was. They should have targeted the excitement that Melvin experienced when thinking about his crimes. Mary could have tricked Melvin into making inculpatory statements by asking him about details he found to be exciting. She could have pretended that she was excited to hear him talk about it. Like she could have said, what was your favorite part? This particular part really made me excited. Describe what happened so I can relive the moment. Mary could have made degrading statements about Brenda and tried to get Melvin to join in. It makes sense that he wouldn't be able to resist doing that. She could have said that she believed that Brenda's response was pathetic and emphasized how much Melvin really made Brenda suffer for rejecting him, like Brenda was really learning a lesson. The investigators didn't seem to understand the personality characteristics of somebody like Melvin. They knew he did something terrible, but they really didn't know why. If they could have had Mary tap into the raw, depraved energy of Melvin, he may have said something inculpatory. In any event, they stopped the effort to record him once they thought they had enough, but it wasn't enough. They should have kept recording until they built a strong case. Now moving to my final thoughts. Brenda Schaefer was victimized by two terrible criminals and the state who failed to properly investigate the case. The only justice that was realized occurred because of Melvin's self-centeredness and grandiosity. His unnecessary and foolish testimony under oath led to him being kept in prison for the vast majority of the years between the murder and his death. He was able to escape investigators, but not his own need for greatness. Ironically, narcissism would be both the cause of his crimes and the mechanism for his punishment. Those are my thoughts on the case of Melvin Ignato. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.